This conference will now be recorded. Okay, there's a good group here so we can kick uh, this webinar off. Um, this is the psychology of remote work for senior leaders. Thanks for joining um, during this lunch hour. Um, I'm Mackenzie LeBert with Mass TLC. Um, just want to take a quick second to recognize our global sponsors um, who not only provide thought leadership but financial support to the organization and enable us to do everything that we do, um, especially during times like this. So really grateful to have support from these organizations. A few housekeeping notes about the webinar. Um, of course, try to stay muted unless you're speaking just to cut down on background noise and feedback. Um, there's a little chat icon you should be able to see. It's usually in the top right of your screen. Um, if you have quick questions, comments, any notes, um, you're welcome to chat over questions. Um, or if, you know, if it feels right, just unmute yourself. And also you could ask your question openly. Um, and this webinar is being recorded. So we will share it afterward for you. So at this time, I'll introduce um, our speakers for today's webinar and uh, kick it over to Jim Daniel, who will start the presentation. Thanks, Mackenzie. I'm gonna share my slides now. So today's presentation, we're gonna have about 20 to 25 minutes to cover uh, a topic that is timely given what we're dealing with. And then after that, we'll have an opportunity to delve more deeply into questions you might have, or even share good ideas or new, new tips and techniques you would add to the conversation. Today, it's myself, Jim Daniel, along with Emma Campbell and Jean-Louis Equichard. Together, uh, collectively, we've got decades of experience in helping people learn how to work virtually and remotely. This time is unlike any other time. So we put together this toolkit primarily because um, the world that we're in right now offers a completely different set of challenges. Working from home meant like taking Friday off and maybe getting caught up on your email. It used to mean that you know it was going off and doing solitary work for a lot of people. Working virtually is done sometimes, but this is an unprecedented moment where everybody's at home all at once, worldwide, whether it's your colleagues, your customers, your business partners, and your family. And adding to it is the fact that we're dealing with stress levels that we've never seen before. We're gonna go more into that later on, but the stresses that are pounding down on us is dramatically affecting our effectiveness as senior leaders. And you need to understand that because it's affecting you and it's affecting your team members. So working remote is a imperfect medium. In particular, the messaging that we're getting day after day, wave after wave, is creating a great deal of fear, uncertainty, and doubt. This fear then drives trust down, trust in your working colleagues, trust in your boss, trust among your team members, even trust among your social network. So as trust comes down, the uh, dynamics of how you communicate and being able to reach through the medium in a much more profound way is what's required. To talk a little bit about this, these challenges, I'd like Emma to share her thoughts. Emma? Thank you, Jim. As Jim has mentioned, the coronavirus crisis is fundamentally human-centric. And we've been listening to staff, and this is what they tell us. First and foremost, for those who are not ill, they want to be they want to continue being safe. Secondly, as changes at work, school and home collide, sending the whole family back inside to keep social distance, they want to feel supported in the massive changes this brings to their work. And for some employees, this will be incredibly stressful and an unsettling time. Setting up a home office may be simple for some, but for others it presents massive challenges. And not to mention looking after the children while trying to meet deadlines and conduct productive meetings online. Finally, people want to be heard more than ever before, and they want to see the right actions and not just rhetoric. They want to engage and they want to be engaged. And this is where we can help. While we can't offer a solution to coronavirus, nor to an end to the chaos that is currently surrounding us, what we offer may help some more than others, and we may not be the best at it. What we know is that for more than two decades, we have practiced and taught how to work virtually, and it's removed a lot of stress and anxiety for those we have helped. We offer a potential relief from the stress and worries that working remotely can cause people. Next slide, please, Jim.
So today the current pursuit of most of humanity is to be safe and to be kept safe. Um, this is natural, our biology drives us to it. So one way to be safe and avoid catching coronavirus means social distancing, which is causing us all to work remotely. So with the stock market collapse and huge amounts of job insecurity, this has created a need for economic safety. The virus doesn't discriminate, and you may have staff who have, been, who have contracted the virus. This may be fair, this, they may be feeling not only physically isolated, but mentally isolated, asking questions like, who have I infected? How could I have done things differently? They need to be reassured. Reach out to them often and let them know you have their back. With our communities being shut down, the only thing we have left to hang on to is our family and our jobs. We don't know what will happen to our jobs, nor do we want to hear hollow promises. What we want is a little bit of control over that destiny. Staff want to engage in open and meaningful conversations to help and to be helped. Over to you, Jean-Louis. Uh, thank you, Emma, Jim, um, if you can give me the next slide. So over the last uh, few decades, uh, we have evolved a hierarchy of need of remote work that you see here. Um, it is very similar to what you would be familiar with, which is the Maslow hierarchy of need at the bottom of the pyramid. You have the elements that must be there for the rest to be able to be sustained. The goal here for most employees and most managers is to get to engage collaboration. This is when you restore productive levels that you had in the workplace and function correctly. Even beyond that, you reach to levels where it becomes natural and effortless, where you do this as a matter of routine. Jim? So the, at the basic of it, are things that I see people think they do right, but they don't. I am regularly in um, virtual meetings where I see people not having the right internet speed. Their sound is choppy, they haven't checked it. They're very uncomfortable. They're on a sofa with a laptop on it. The light is horrible. The camera points up to their chin. It's just not working. Obviously, not anybody in this call. Everybody is doing well. <laughs> um, but um, they don't have the right equipment. Their sound is horrible. They don't know how to turn themselves off mute. And so as a result, we hear kids and dogs in the background and cats. <clears throat> and, and all of this could be nailed out in about five minutes for your employees. But we didn't spend the time to do that, did we? We went right into it. We jumped into it as if because we had done it once or twice, it was the routine. And the reality is that we can bring that back and say, oh, hold on a second, right? The basic infrastructure needs to be there for all the rest to happen, so let's get that right. It takes about five minutes per person to get that right, to get the correct lighting, to reposition people. I see some people uh, during that video conference saying, you know, you can move slightly to the right, slightly to the left, you get a better lighting. Some of you are backlit and all that sort of things. And I'm not hearing you, but I will later on. And then what we do in virtual is we jump into it as if it was a meeting face to face. We did not allow ourselves even five minutes to debug the thing and make it work. We think that we're all experts at it and we're not. This is a novel environment as a routine. Yes, every so often we did a video call that worked but now it is the routine of work we are 100 percent dependent on technology and we don't know how to debug that and so what we do is we take employees through coaching experience or managers through coaching experience within five minutes they get it right next slide jim and then we can get to the next level the next level is a level that you ought to be very very scared about uh, we're seeing an increase in cyber criminal all around that are attacking for and nonprofit alike. They are trying to take the opportunity that the network on which those conversations are happening, the network in which the data is happening, the network in which the information is being processed, 
are no longer as secure as they were in the workplace. It is at home. Just think for a moment, in your workplace, do you allow Minecraft to be running and Netflix during working hours? But at home, this is what the reality of it. And on top of that, there are unproven new pieces of software that are popping up. They may have worked in an environment where they were occasionally used, but now you used a lot. And let me give you an example of, um, of some of them. We, we're seeing that the, um, the software that was used not routinely is now being looked at by cyber criminal and saying, well, this is a, a software that used to be used very seldom, but now, now that it's used in the home by the rest of the people in the home, the children, the partners and others, then we're going to attack that to get at you as a manager, you as an employee. And this is very, very critical. Yet most people do not know how to set up a basic cybersecurity package. Sure, the corporation is likely to have given um, their employees a VPN or some other technology to protect that information stream. But the reality is the home network is not there. And at risk is an additional stress for the employees who would not only see the work being compromised, but also their personal finances and everything else that is riding on the network. And this is really something that also can be nailed down very quickly. There are capabilities of ISPs that most householders of ISPs have not looked at, which might allow better security, some of which are listed here. Next slide, Jim. But enough about um, you know, those two first layers about our hierarchy of remote needs, the reliable infrastructure and the cyber safety there. What we want to get to is engage collaboration. We want to restore the way we were doing work uh, and the trust that we had when we were making meeting face to face. And for that, we have to understand one thing, is the only thing that is the same is what's inside our head, which is our brain. Our neurochemistry, our way of interacting is the same. Except the context has changed slightly. Look at the little vignette above your screen. You will find that for most of you, you're seeing not the full person, but just about that much of a person, right? And most of you are not showing your hands. But neurochemistry tells us that when hands are shown, it increases trust. Notice my hands. Um, and, and that helps, hello. And, uh, and that is an important thing. We, we forget to do that. In many parts, we have our hands next to our keyboards. We're trying to take notes and others. We forget that they're out of the frame. Now in a meeting, think about how in a meeting you are. In a meeting, you see those hands moving. You have people next to you. You see everything moving. It's comfortable. It's okay but no longer online. So remember to do this. Also, it is a great opportunity to have eye contact, to bring the camera at the right level so that you can engage with people eye to eye, which by the way was impossible in meetings because in meetings, the seating arrangement made it so that you could only see probably two or three people across from you eye to eye, but not the people next to you. So there's a value there of being doing it virtually. Jim? The first thing that you will be faced with as managers is continuing one-on-one -on -one conversations. As Emma mentioned, uh, it is important to have this conversation, but in the past, we were teaching that as the complexity of the message grew, the medium had to grow with it. In other words, if you had to schedule a meeting, you could do that by email. It was not a complex task. But if you wanted to discuss the strategy for your business or a new product development, then you sometimes had to get together for multiple days in person to have those rich and difficult conversations. But this is no longer possible. We have clipped an entire segment of possibilities by being away from each other. And this is where it brings me to, uh, I have a little bit of chagrin of hearing social distancing because in fact, what we need and must have is physical distance, not social distance. What we have is we need is social proximity at a physical distance. We need to reconnect with each other, so with our employees, with our teams. And for that, we only have 
that graph segment, which is the video medium. Next, Jill. One-on-one -on -one meetings. Be there in person. Make eye contact. Check the emotional status. We are still human. Every one of us is worried. We are experiencing different things, but at the same time, the same context. It is scary. It is worrisome. Maybe somebody has an ailing person that is older, that they're worried about, they haven't heard about. And let me give you a little story of what happened on my call about a week ago. Um, we were having a one-on-one -on -one with somebody, and suddenly they said, look, I'm not feeling too good. I said, well, why is that? The mom, my dad lives in Bush, and um, normally we check on them, and he checks on us every day, and we haven't heard from him for a day. So we're really worried. I said, well, how do you check on him? Well, we send the sheriff to his place to check every so often uh, if we haven't heard from him. So I'm waiting to hear from the sheriff. And it's a remote area, and the sheriff has a radio and others. And so if during that one-on-one -on -one call, um, I get interrupted by my phone, it's the sheriff calling. Fortunately, they... Um, the, uh, the elder gentleman had just been left out of his cabin, had locked himself out, and for a few hours had spent time in the woods, and, uh, and that's how he couldn't connect. But those are the reality of the one-on-one. -on -one. If we don't reconnect with people at the beginning, like we did when we were face-to-face -face in the office around a cup of warm beverage, saying, how are you doing? How are things? Uh, the whatever, the kids, the dogs, the pets, the, 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 the sport team, and others, the coaching, anything. You know, then it doesn't work. And we keep forgetting about that when we get in front of the camera. We think the meeting has started, but really the relationship has started. And that's what you have to work. Uh, um, a tip that Jim and I have used quite a lot is working out loud. So we turn on our cameras and we put each other off on mute. So we see each other working as if we were in two offices or cubicle next to each other. And then at one point, we'll chat and say, hey, let, let's hop on a call. I have a good idea. This is as if you had a colleague next to you working. And it also brings, by seeing the face of the person and seeing them working, it brings all that social environment uh, that works. And then finally, let's all be accepting of errors. The software we are using, the technology we're using, well, that doesn't work that well. And so uh, uh, there'll be things that don't go well. And our ability to recover there shouldn't add stress to it. Next slide, Jim. Very quickly, we'll get into team meetings. Um, team meetings are the bread and butter of, uh, of meetings. Um, but um, there are two relationships that we have had historically with the screen. You'll recognize those. One is the television. And just think about the image of a person in front of the television. Um, are they engaged? Not really. We tend to receive that medium in a broadcast way, very passive. We'll listen. The nice thing recently is we can actually put it on pause, get something and come back, right? And that's our, our relationship with the screen. The other relationships we may have had, but definitely a lot of people have had is the video game. The video game we're engaged, we have a task to do. If we stop, it doesn't continue, it crashes, it's game over. And so we have to be present and engaged. You'll agree with me that what we want is team meetings that are not TV meetings where nobody's engaged and everybody is passive, but video game meetings. And for that, you just have to give people tasks to do so that they are engaged. So for example, we could give to every one of you a task. One of us could say, hey, could you please monitor the chat room to make sure that nobody is having a problem with audio and video and starts using the chat? Hey, could you make sure that um, you do, people don't spend more than two minutes talking? Hey, could you make sure of this? So by having tasks by everybody, everybody has to pay attention to what's happening in the meeting because they have something to do. And this is a little trick that we have to force engagement where people, by paying attention to what's happening, engage better with the rest of the group. Um, next slide. I, oh, of course. Um, meeting management, good meeting management is paramount when you go virtual. Um, and then we get to the very, very large meetings. Uh, we're organizing some um, some meetings that are in the thousands of people. Um, I have actually one um, starting uh, today uh, with 6,000 people. 
the the problem there is that um, two things. First, uh, it's become a, a perfect target for either um, advertisers of bad things and and people who love to uh, to crash meeting in a bad way. Yeah, you may have heard the term that's gone out now called Zoom mobbing, which is simply where somebody comes up in one of those meetings, hijacks the the camera, and starts either on chat or on video, uh, blurting out. You know, inappropriate stuff everywhere. Um, I had a colleague who pinged me yesterday. They just got that in a, in a few hundred people meeting. This is getting all too common now. You have very little control over what's happening because you're in general opening that to the general public and you're seeing all those videos. Yes, they look nice. Everybody is there in their home office. But the reality is what if you have a bad actor and that can be very disruptive? This is one thing to work that we can work on the cyber safety aspect of things. How do you control well those meetings so that you prevent those activities? And if they happen, how you can shut them down within less than a minute. On the other side of things, when people in a team meeting didn't put themselves on mute, it was relatively easy to find them out and say, hey, Bobby, hey, Mary, could you put yourself on mute? When you have a thousand people, it's impossible. Great meeting management is really impossible. Showing the speaker video well and clearly to everyone is, is also important. Remember my reliable infrastructure and why I said it was so important? But the reality is when you see so many videos, it actually uses more of your internet access and by doing so, it taxes it more. So if your little Johnny or little Susie is doing something on it, or if your partner is doing a yet another thousand people meeting at the same time, <clears throat> your internet con um, connections may be totally saturated. There are ways to recover from that, but this is why we're teaching people how to have a very reliable infrastructure and troubleshooting. Software that we will use for those meetings might allow breakout rooms. The modality that you may use are very different. In other words, you may have in person uh, allowed a meeting to happen for two or three days, but right now it might be two or three months. Two or three months where you have essentially a stream going on. So think of it as the difference between the movie and the TV series, right? The TV series lasts a long time. It's about the same length you know, in total and same interest, but it captures your interest over. It allows you to have people who are more introverted, who tend to think about ideas the day after the meeting to re-participate and re-engage. So it's a great way of engaging a diverse group of people. Um, and it's really, really important to rehearse those. Next one, Jen. So what I'd like to do is build from what JL was saying. Imagine that you've got all the all the foundational stuff right, and you really do have an engaged collaboration model that works. You're, you've gotten better at reaching through the medium and finding out how your staff are doing. You're doing great and much better meeting management with better tasks. Everybody's engaged. You start to realize you're in a whole nother plane now. You can start to work differently. Let's just start with the simplest. The ultimate low carbon commute is not flying for a sales meeting all the way around the world. Now you can actually find ways to engage with people far differently. Face-to-face -face will always be important, but now you're gonna have a much better option. There's no reason to even replicate everything you do. Think about a typical um, bad day as people describe it. They say, oh, I was stuck in meetings all day long. I had back-to-back -back meetings. I didn't get any work done. And then when I got to my office at the end of the day, my email box had exploded. Sound familiar? For many of us who work virtually, you flip that model on its head. You don't meet to talk about the work. You meet and get the work done in the meeting. There is no more meeting to talk about work. So you move much more rapidly and you work in a stream-like fashion versus a serial sequential of I'm either in meetings or I'm in work. You can pop in and out. And now you suddenly can have much deeper and more meaningful connections in a very different way, much larger population of people, larger uh, number of work items. You can work far more creatively. Ultimately, you're setting yourself up to develop a new set of management and working skills that are the basis for being <clears throat> active in a digitally transformed business model. This is a very important and positive thing that can come, come out of this time in our lives of unprecedented stress. But with that being said, back to you, Emma. 
Thanks, Jim. So the coronavirus has turned into a crisis, impacting workplaces everywhere. Companies who in the past didn't have a work from home policy are now forced to make it a priority. Employees are becoming increasingly overwhelmed with the changes to their normal routine and with the kids at home. They're managing workloads, deadlines while trying to occupy children. Um, they're competing for internet bandwidth with their family. And for some, the opposite may apply and they may be isolated and alone. So employers can help to reduce the panic and keep employee morale up during this outbreak. Be intentional about communications, touch base with staff regularly. Utilize instant messaging chats, check in on staff to see how they're doing. And I think what is really important is to relax policies and adjust expectations, giving staff the time to get into their new normal. Thanks, Jim. Gail? Yeah. So um, this is what you would expect out of um, um, a typical engagement working with us. And this is what we listen um, to our customers and they tell us. The, the first thing is um, that actually it will increase the trust in the organization. It's, f it's funny enough that there was there's less trust in the meeting. Why? Because if you are keeping people engaged, as I mentioned earlier, giving them tasks and others, and they are present in the meeting, they're actually more present than they were physically. Physically, remember your colleagues when they were under the table with, used to be the Blackberry they used to put under the table, <laughs> and then eventually the phone or something is twitching and buzzing or somebody has their phone on the table, but they, you know that there's an edge little light that that's gonna tell them that something is happening and others, and they were not really there. Um, <clears throat> also, uh, the meeting may have been inconvenient for them. So by having shorter video meetings versus longer face-to-face -face meetings, you're allowed to space time. And so it allows to for them to do the other tasks they needed to do. By the way, it allows you to do other tasks as well, as I mentioned, for example, checking in colleagues. So it restores the trust in the organization, a trust that is needed right now uh, uh, more than anything else. And it also restores that trust because there is no trust in anything else. There is definitely uh, no knowledge out there and knowledge tends to, uh, to, to breed trust. It's a novel situation we are experiencing. Um, also, there are so many productivity traps in working virtually. Um, when an executive shared with me, she, she said to me, look, uh, I just can't work outside of the office and say, why? So every time I take my tablet, the only thing I want to do is shop on it. I can't have a call. I can't work on it. I am just, um, it just doesn't work for me. And we have to realize that this is a lot of what we used to do. We came home, we used our computers, tablets, or others for entertainment and personal activities and others. And it's so easy to fall into those traps and to find those employees are slowly drifting away from the organizations because they're left alone at home, not checked upon and others. And then the, the next thing is, we all have to look at a world where coronavirus is behind us, where we have restored uh, productive norms and an economy, and we are restarting that. And uh, the question for all of your organization is, who's going to be ahead in that new world? Because we've definitely all been slammed down today, and pretty much everybody is in the same boat there. But when we restart, will you have gained new capabilities where you can engage with your customer in a different way, engage with your employees in a different way, perhaps build a different ecosystem of contributors to your enterprise, and do that with the agility that online and remote world work? You may want to source your talent across a broader geographical base, across multiple time zones and others. So those are the capabilities that um, you would expect out of it. The first one is it will increase the trust. The second one is you'll have less issues and you'll know where the pitfalls are. And the third one is you'll better be prepared for the post-COVID-19 world. Thanks, Jim.
Sorry, I didn't mean to click JL, but uh, I, you said you're uh, you're you're okay with errors. So, um, so I just wanted to summarize what we just talked about. You understand that there's this basic level of just getting good at using the tools, but it's getting really attentive to what JL described as being still being social, but at a physical distance. So I'm going to start by asking a question to the group here. This is not a normal Q&A. I'm going to start by asking you all. I would like one by one, and uh, Mackenzie, I don't know how you want to help moderate this, um, if you want to call out names, or and but give us one good example of social inclusion that you've experienced that you thought, oh, that really brought people back together. It could be from work or it could be from friends. Mackenzie? Could you see who wants to uh, add to that right now real quick? Yeah, sure. So um, I could either call through the list alphabetically or if people want to chat, you know, that they have something, I'll call them out from the chat box. Go ahead. Call on some names. Make sure, hey, we're playing a video game, man. You got to be part of this. Come on, let's go. Okay, so pay attention to your videos. If somebody puts their hand like this in front of the camera, that means they want attention. Okay, on great. You. Good night. Renaud, you're on mute. There you go. Nope, we don't hear you. All right, we'll go on to the next person and we'll come back to Vinod. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Got you now. Oh, okay. Uh, so uh, one of the things I did that worked well was uh, around two weeks back, we have a privilege of having an office in China and since they are ahead of the curve, I organized a meeting whereby people from there could share their experience because by then they were already seventh week of quarantine to share and that actually resonated and we had more than 50 people on the Zoom call and even though the topic was going to be more about working remotely, the entire thing was about how do you take care of yourself mentally and emotionally. So it's also being able to shift in real time and having appropriate messengers because they had greater legitimacy because they have been at the front end of this while we are trying to still play catch up and learn from them. Great. Thank you for note. Anybody else? Um, by the way, uh, just so everyone knows, both Emma and JL are coming to you live from New Zealand. So it gives you a sense of the distance and time that can be overcome by using the technology. Somebody raised uh, their hand? Mike. Go ahead, Mike. Hey, McKenzie, uh, thank you, everyone. Great to be here. Um, two things that have happened to me that I, I was really surprised by. Number one, I had a lunch meeting scheduled. Uh, before the virus, and uh, you know, the person I had the lunch meeting with said, "Look, let's keep the lunch meeting. We'll just do it by Zoom," and it was so much fun. It was it was great. So I would encourage that type of thing. And then the other um, the other thing that happened is this was outside of work, but I think it's it, it's relatable. We have friends in San Francisco that we haven't flown out to see in a while. And all of a sudden, they said, "Let's let's have a um, family get together and and do a game." And the kids really enjoyed it. And we figured out how to make the game work. And uh, we were closer to them than we've ever been on just a regular phone call. So those are my two comments. Oh, I love. Hey, Mike, I love that example. What was the uh, game you were able to play, and how did you play it remotely? Uh, the 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 name of the game was a uh, code name. If anyone knows that game, it's called Code Name, and uh, you you put down all these cards. It has um, I guess part of Battleship in it because you don't know where the cards are on the spaces, and you have to give one word that allows your your partner to choose two or three cards at once. So for instance. If one of the cards is cell, another is microscope, you might say biology for two. And then they have to pick out of, of all the cards which ones are related to biology. 
Great. Okay, questions that folks might have or other ideas they'd like to think? I see the chat window is open. Hi, folks. I'm not on video, but can you hear me? I'm on the phone. Yes. Oh, great. Um, so um, I'm Kirsten Chambers. I'm actually a Kiwi working here in Boston, so I was delighted to hear the uh, lovely accents flowing through the screen to me. Um, <laughs> one thing that we've done um, at the, I work at the British Consulate and we've been closed for about uh, 10 days now. Uh, but before that, I was off for surgery. So I'm actually, I've been working from home for 53 days and pretty much in a row now. So I had to establish some um, virtual working practices anyway back then. And so what I, what I was doing was regular calls, all the normal things that you would do with your team. But in order to get the team socializing, we, we just do a virtual pub um, every Friday afternoon at, at four o'clock and we do it on Zoom. We have about, we have 20, uh, we have 18 staff and we've had kind of 15 or 16 people joining and uh, we've had pub quizzes and all of that sort of thing just to keep people socially engaging. Um, and I really, uh, I wrote down the quote that you said before about social proximity at a physical distance. And I think that's a really important differentiator to what we are saying to people right now. They, you feel like you have to keep your distance. Um, and I don't think that they've realized that it's social, socially closer, but physically di uh, distant. Because I know some of the, that's a great example that the virtual pubs, the quarantinis, the getting together just with a, anything you want. Somebody also informed me that you, you can always should have a coffee cup and you, no one really needs to know what's in the coffee cup. Um, but Monica, <laughs> can you, you did something very interesting. You created a Zoom meeting and you got uh, lots of people into breakouts. Can you just describe what that was like at the, uh, for the social hour? Sure. So you're talking about the, the church, the church social hour? <laughs> yeah. Where you had um, what, 40, 50 people? Yeah, yeah, it's running. It's running about 40, uh, 40 people or so, um, and has worked out a lot better than I expected, actually. So, for that, we use a Zoom meeting. Um, so we we live stream the service um, on Facebook, and then we open up a Zoom meeting so that people can join for a coffee hour. And we set up breakout rooms. I set up about ten breakout rooms, and then I just kind of randomly assign half a dozen people or so to each of the breakout rooms, so that it's not quite so huge. Because if you're talking to 40 people, it's it's pretty hard. Um, and so those people can always move back to the main room if they want and get moved into a different room if they if they choose to do so. Um, but it seems to be working well, and people seem to people are <laughs> are actually not wanting to miss it. I've had we've had other things that we've needed to schedule at the same time. They're like, no, we need our Zoom coffee hours. So um, so that's been fun. Thank you, Monica. Uh, reflect for a moment. Where was the last time you had a face-to-face -face meeting that you didn't want to miss? Not because it was important for work, but because you actually enjoyed it, right? Uh, or uh, a meeting like Mike described, where you were so engaged that you can actually engage your kids into it and others. And, and those are the type of things, the tips that you're learning from each other on how to keep engagement and how to keep satisfaction and starting to get to that natural and joyful way of working online. One other little tip I can give you is um, develop little visual cues. Um, JL mentioned using raising your hand, it's something you can do in a meeting, uh, but we've got these fun little things. So when somebody's saying something that we like, and I don't know if you can see my picture right now, you can chew view everyone or view talking person, but if you can see my picture, you'll suddenly see me put this up, right? And I'll go, and that just means I'm happy. And JL is saying, whoa, wait, wait, wait. And I'm saying, no, no, no. You know, and these are the ways you can kind of get yourself kind of in the flow of the meeting. Uh, you'll also note, and I think Joe mentioned this, you know, in the beginning, I'm looking at a camera. My screen is down below it. I'm not staring at something down here. I'm looking at a big camera, which is set up right behind my monitor. And so it's the tips and techniques to get it so that you feel comfortable so you can just sit back and do work and it becomes, um, it becomes really joyful. I just, I don't know how to describe it to folks who haven't yet experienced it, other than it goes from feeling like you're um, 
working at listening and attending a meeting and kind of a it's like buying a pair of new shoes they're kind of they feel they feel uncomfortable that you haven't broken them in yet and then one day it's like breathing you can actually be super effective and share information very quickly so and we have the sharing is off so i'm gonna is, is my sharing on Are you um, are you seeing my uh, the three their backgrounds for a moment? Yes. So okay. we've been doing this all over the world. Um, you know, Emma has been doing HR work globally for organizations like Ashoka, hand, managing across multiple continents. JL, when you were the CIO for the Nature Conservancy, you ran operations, all the technical services for them from New Zealand, correct? Yeah, that's correct. We had operations in um, about 40 countries and about 700 offices around the world. And you led and managed your teams entirely remotely. You did, and you also no, backed that up with face to face. I start. I ended up starting the New Zealand program, so I was a bit lonely. And Tom, you you've been uh, you've been thinking about this a lot, just for Mass TLC as a as an association of the future. Can you share? with your thoughts about where we're all going collectively as a sector? Yeah, no, it's 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 interesting. I think, uh, you know, I think, I guess for a long time, I've thought about our business here as being not about running events, not about, you know, getting people in meetings, but about how do we build community? You know, how do we share content, the, you know, the best practices, the thought leadership, the key insights, and how do we do stuff as a collective that we can, um, uh, you know, as a group of companies. And so, you know, moving online, you know, certainly having board members like Jim and other people has, has been helpful. We've been using these tools for some time, but um, having the whole world suddenly move offline uh, or, uh, you know, online, I guess, uh, out of the, the traditional has, has been really interesting. And, and I, I guess to your earlier question, I'll say, you know, Kate, who's on the call um, as well, who leads our operations, uh, brought a, a great best practice of, you know, we have a daily water cooler meeting um, every morning at 9.15. And so, the whole team gets online and and you know, we just catch up and to your point it's it's actually more inclusive than in the traditional office because we all dial into it um whereas in the office sometimes people are there sometimes they're not um but uh but yeah so it's a it's a really interesting you know it changes the way you think about things it's not just getting on a video call but we're really trying to change how you interact with people so to build on mike beck's um experience with reaching out to somebody across the country one thing you can do that's very different right now we could have always done it in the past we could have always just picked up the phone and called somebody but use the pandemic as a reason to check in with somebody that you haven't talked to in a very long time and say can i have a five minute cup of coffee with you over a zoom chat you'll find that there's an unusual thing that's going on that people not only crave the social contact that we talked about earlier but it's a great opportunity to renew re, re, uh, relationships and acquaintances and family and friends. Um, it's a great way to pick up and deepen contacts with, uh, if you're in the middle of a sales cycle, for example, I was talking to a salesman um, yesterday whose business is selling, if of all things, trade show booths. So his business is effectively dead, you would think. And he said, it's not dead. So what we're doing right now, number one, I'm spending more time just calling up my customers and checking in with them. And more importantly, we've come up with a virtual trade show booth and we're designing it in real time. Like we're finding vendors who make things that we could possibly use. And we're calling up our customers saying, hey, could we maybe try this on you? You want to help me try it out? And we're finding them to be far more flexible and more interested than we ever thought. So who would have thought in the middle of this sort of unbelievable wave of stress from both disease and economic stresses, you could find such a silver lining of deep connection with people and all of it. So. This uh, need for social uh, is at the heart. Go ahead, Mike. Jim, uh, I mean, I I love what you guys are doing here. It's amazing, and I keep getting surprised every day. There's a hiring manager in my organization that when he's been in the office, I've had a hard time connecting with him. We had a Zoom call this morning uh, with me and the head of people operations, and I said to him, I said, wow, I love your bookcase behind you. And he's at his home and he turned around and he pulled out a baseball and he said, look, let me tell you about this. And it was a Stan Musial signed baseball that he had. 
and he gave us the whole story. And it was the best connection I've had with this guy in the year and a half I've been at the company. Isn't that amazing? Are others having some of those weird, you know, uh, you know, we, um, positive peaks into people's lives? We've heard the stories online of the negatives where the, the poor person inadvertently went into the bathroom and didn't realize pressing mute didn't turn off the camera. Um, but any other uh, fun stories like that? One of our member companies um, was telling us on a call last week that what they're doing is um, show and tells on their meetings. So people are just like going and grabbing something from their house and just explaining to, because we're all getting this much more personal, closer look into everyone's lives. So just as a way to kick off the meetings, they're doing kind of like round robin, everyone do a quick show and tell. So it's kind of fun. Um, how about pet showings? Has there been a fair amount of... Uh... Meet my dog or cat, gerbil, snake. Oh, or... oh yeah, I think there's been a lot of those. There's actually the, the Mass TLC team has set up a uh, Mass Tech Pets hashtag uh, on Twitter. So uh, not only have we all been meeting each other's animals, uh, but but we've set up a uh, you know some some uh, photos are online. So if you if you have pets that are working with you, um, you know throw them out on Twitter as well. You can also add infants to the list. Oh, who doesn't love somebody else's kid? And you know the odor is very low when it's uh, when it's done through a um, through a video con. Keep losing the focus on that one. So I mean that's that's if you can if you can just summarize this whole thing right. So again, JL stressed that getting the basics right so you can see the light, the sound is good, requires a little bit of setup, not a lot of time, but just getting it right. Then the cyber safety work don't. Trust me right now, you probably got more really interesting phishing, spear phishing emails coming in right now with that look like they're from DocuSign or some other tool that you don't normally use. But you say, oh, maybe I should be using that right now. There's a lot of those. Be careful, make sure you're set up. But mostly start thinking about making this medium more social, more engaging, more like the video game, less like the TV, getting everybody on the call involved, uh, you know, we overuse the word gamifying, but just making it interesting or well-structured. And then if you can end early, we'll be able to end early, give you your time back. Um, and, um, and then all those fun little things are gonna start to pop out of this. We hope that you will become inspired to work virtually, to try out new ways of working. Uh, we spent a lot of time engaging with people around digital business transformation, which at its heart begins with reimagining the world of work. It's not hierarchical anymore, it's more distributed, it's flat, networked, and hyper-aware, and it moves very fast. And when you move into these new ways of working, you're gonna find that the old ways of working were making you tired and stressed out. And the new ways of working are gonna make you feel really happy because you're actually changing the underlying hormones in your body. So the neuro, neurochemistry of your brain is gonna be nourished by working in a, in, a, in a way that's social, fun, interactive, gratifying, and you get stuff done. And that's the thing I love about working with JL and Emma is we can just bang stuff out really fast, a day or two, and boom, we're all set. Uh, instead of having spent probably in calendar time, two weeks with three meetings where we're trying to interleave all sorts of other work on top of it. So we hope this was useful. If you uh, liked it or you want more information, you need some help or advice, um, I've got my contacts at the bottom of the screen. This is all recorded. I can also forward you the contacts for JL and Emma. And again, we thank you for your time. We put this together because we thought we needed to have a unique look at how we help people in a time of coronavirus first survive, but ultimately we want you all to thrive post this, this period. So we appreciate your time today and enjoy um, the rest of your uh, afternoon, wherever you may be. Yeah, thank you. Um, remember Thanks everyone for joining. Physical distance. Say again, JL. I say remember to be social at a physical distance. Bye, everybody. Thanks, Thanks everyone. everyone. Uh, thank bye. you. Thank you.